Today's unemployment figures show the economy is moving in the right direction. The drop in unemployment is one more sign that the economy is strengthening. Muckrakes holding journalists accountable. This is The Hill. It's Robbie Suave, Brianna Joy Gray interviewing Seymour Hirsch. To you that made you confident oh. in what that person was telling you was accurate? Oh, if I did, I'd just be out of business, you know, and uh, I've been doing this for a long time with unnamed sources. It, it all depends on where you, when you do it, when you don't do it. When I was at the New York Times, some of the great stories, uh, many of the, the stories that were very important, or at least generated a lot of news. In one case, the congressional hearings, uh, the church hearings into the CIA, I, I had no, no name sources, but that time, you know, that was then and this is now. So now there's a lot of criticism, uh, and I understand that. Um, um, uh, I, I can't talk about my source other than if, if you read the story carefully, uh, um, uh, as I, I'm sure you did, um, uh, I, the person that's talking to me, uh, if, you, if you're trying to figure out who he is, he's never, he or she is never in a meeting. They're just describing what they know. And that's not uh, inadvertent. That's, you know, that's just the way you protect people. And uh, because there, a lot of people could know things. Um, it wasn't all CIA. It was a, a joint group that was set up at the direction of Jake Sullivan, the, um, uh, the national security advisor. And in a nutshell, I'll just tell you what happened. Um, it's, it's the fall of 2021. The Russians are already, the, the, the Putin's, but let's just stick with Putin. Putin is already lining up his troops in, in Belarus. And it's clear that he's probably gonna go and the, there's a meeting convened, uh, Jake convenes a meeting, um, uh, I would assume at the, at, the, at the request of the president, uh, Joe Biden, and he brings in a bunch of high level people from the community, you know, the NSA, CIA, uh, uh, State Department, Joint Chiefs of Staff, what you will, Treasury Department, they, have, they supply the money. And they meet in a secu very secure room in the executive office building. Everybody in Washington knows what that is. It's on the compound right next to the White House itself, where most of the offices are. And the issue is, uh, they started in December of 2021. And the question they have, and this is a, 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 word, a word of art, is um, uh, <laughs> this is language that is known inside the community. Whether what we want to produce, this group, are actions and recommendations, recommendations that are reversible or irreversible. If they're reversible, we're talking about sanctions, et cetera. If they're irreversible, you're talking about kinetic stuff. And eventually, it, over the next couple of weeks, it emerged that the issue was, of course, the decision was gonna be uh, something uh, kinetic. And it eventually, I'm talking about by January, uh, there was a fix on the pipelines could be it. We could hit the pipelines. The worry was always, as, as most well, most people don't know, Nord Stream One, there are two pipelines that go supply gas, really a very low price and a huge amount of gas to industrial Germany. The first pipeline began in 2011. It was called Nord Stream One, and historically, going back to the Kennedy years, and certainly in the Bush Cheney years, and certainly in this government, and when Joe Biden was in the was vice president, he chaired a group on this. The worry we always had about Russia, always with its great resources of natural gas. Uh, they, they have uh, from way, <laughs> they just have tons of it, gas and, and, um, and, o and oil. And um, uh, the worry was that, that Russia was weaponizing this gas. It was using it to get leverage in West Germany, West, Western Europe and Germany. And that was always something that was a problematical uh, for us. We, didn't, we, we wanted to keep Russia from having energy power. And so, it's, and so the same thing happened in this White House in the meeting, the idea was, what do you do with it? And so one of the options the group came up with, they said, we can blow them. Uh, I don't know how far they were, but this was obviously by mid-January of 2022. And by this time, the Russians have as many as 100,000 troops coming. If they're not there then, they're there within a few weeks. They're going. And, and uh, we know it. And uh, to the amazement of the group that was, um, had been assembled, and uh, I assure you that the president and others didn't have hands-on feeling about it. You don't do it that way. They're, they're always isolated. Uh, uh, they had began their, uh, they, they said it can be done. 
And then, to their amazement, Victoria Newland, the Under Secretary of State, in last in last, in, uh, last January, um, again when Russia hasn't come, she gives she at a news conference she said, "I assure you, if, if this if the Russians come, Nord Stream Two will not exist. It's a brand new. It was the second pipe. Nord Stream Two was the second gas pipe that was finished, uh, built. It took ten, eight, ten years, billions of dollars. It was ready to go by early to late 2021, and the Germans." sanction it they cut it down it was full of gas but the germans they didn't pump because the german government obviously under pressure from us um uh, froze it so it's just sitting there full of gas on, on uh, 750 miles one pipeline 700 they both were 750 miles or so all the way from uh from a corner of russia near saint uh, uh leningrad saint petersburg all the way down to the tip of uh, a city in in um Western, I think, of uh, uh, Germany. I get my map mixed up all the time. Anyway, um, it, was, it just was, uh, for the Germans, it was manna. It, there was so much gas, even on Nord Stream 1, that the German uh, um, uh, German companies that had an interest, uh, there was, Nord Stream was controlled by um, uh, 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 Russian oligarchs, Gazprom. They owned 51% of it, which means that a lot of the money was kicked back into the Russian uh, uh, treasury. Of course it was, billions every year. But 49% of the pipeline was owned by four Western companies, and they all had stock. And those Western companies, there was enough gas for them to sell it to other uh, mm -hmm. people dealing in, in, in uh, home gas heating, et cetera, uh, downstream, they call it. It was that much. It was, a, it was a bonanza. And the second pipeline was ready to go, and that would have been um, made the Russian ability in the eyes of the White House, and not only this White House, but other White Houses all along, Weapon is weaponization of the gas. Yeah. So she then, well, for reasons <laughs> unknown, at a news conference said, if Russia goes to, if 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 Russia attacks Nord Stream 2 by one way or another, I don't that's cl very close to the exact language, will be will will not go. Mr. And Hirsch, then a couple what, weeks later, what, you're, what you're describing, I think, is the circumstances that show that the incentives here point really against Russia. And of course, the investigations, the independent investigations that have already taken place have found no um, you know, evidence that Russia was at all involved. And in fact, as you've described, there's plenty, of, there's a conflict of interest that you've described between Germany and, and Western Europe, who are, could be the beneficiaries of, of Russian, of cheap Russian oil, and the United States, who has these broader um, security concerns in terms of its own proxy war with Russia. So I want to get back to, if we can, this issue of the people who are criticizing you on the basis of the source. And I wondered if you could give us any more insight into what you, not not any obviously uh, facts about who the source is or, or any identifying information, but what made you feel confident about the source's firsthand knowledge uh, and the accuracy of the knowledge that the source presented to you. Obviously, there's a great deal of um, kind of factual detail about how strategically the plan was carried out. But in terms of the source representing, confirming that the source was who they represented, that they were in a position where they would have had firsthand knowledge of the events that they described to you, um, can you tell us anything about what assured you that the source was accurately representing their firsthand knowledge? I've been in this business with sources like this for 50 years. Um, when I first did Beeline, uh, there was, you know, overwhelmingly disapproval of what I wrote, and most of the stories I wrote that were controversial has always been attacked on the, on the, you know, it's it's easy to get rid of something on the basis of anonymity, and so um, uh, you have to understand um, there's there's no alternatives. Either people, the people I've known inside. Um, have one thing in common, and, and mil whether military or civilian, and that is they really understand that they've taken their oath of office to, not to not to the their boss, not to the general or admiral, uh, and not to not to the president, but to the constitution. And those are people that, when they get troubled by things that are going on, have talked to me. And this, this been going on. I've done this for 50 years. So on the and uh, I'm not interested in committing suicide, and I certainly knew. The uh, uh, I, I can't. I, you're getting me. I, I don't even want to talk about what I know. I wrote the story, and I'll you know I'll give you a hypothetical if you want. I'll give you a question to ask. Sure. You know, next time somebody at the White House briefing who doesn't want to be doesn't want to be called again, uh, called on again for the next two months, why don't they ask the president, hey, or the White House or the White House whatever the press spokesman whoever it is there, why don't they ask him 
say, you know what, this happened in September the 26th, last year, and um, uh, uh, nobody knew what did happen, but four days later, uh, Jake Sullivan gave a, pre a, a briefing, and he was asked about it, and he said, well, he, he read, you know, the, the, somebody asked if they thought Russia did it, and he said the usual things, nobody likes Russia in that White House. And, and certainly in that CIA, as far as I can tell from the spokesman. And um, what he said is, well, there's two countries are looking at it, uh, Sweden and Norway, and we'll see what happens with their investigation. Uh, it's not Sweden and Norway, Sweden and Denmark. The Norwegians who were very involved with us haven't said, have said nothing. And so a month later, sure enough, the, the, Swedes, the Swedes and the Danes issued a report saying that after they studied it, they concluded that indeed something had happened under the water. There had been an explosion. That was the extent of their investigation. So what the White House has, what the president has, if he really wants to know, he's got something called the Office of National Intelligence, which is the highest level office, uh, on, oversees all of the intelligence in the United States government. And they have an office of, uh, the, the ONI, they have an incredibly good, competent uh, head of, uh, of intelligence there. He could have, what the phrase they use inside is task those people to do a study. If he chose also to really dig, he could have asked the CIA, which has a director of intelligence that does terrific work, I will tell you, very solid stuff. He could have asked the CIA to do a study. And there's also a secret, another third intelligence group that nobody talks much about. When we have a covert operation, an, an agent that's an, an operation like this that's undercover, they have their own intelligence. And we're talking about really old source. If you have people overseas doing stuff uh, that are tricky, you want to really protect them. And so why don't you ask if they ever ask the community for a study? Because I'll tell you what the answer is. They never did. And so why don't you think they did? Well, and, and, and Mr. Wondering. Hirsch, uh, how would you respond to, uh, there's been some reporting I've seen that the ships you said that, that were used, the Norwegian ships, there's some conflicting GPS data showing is, is suggesting that they were not actually in the the area how would you respond to that part of the criticism it's called um, um it's osync you know it's a uh, uh, open open source intelligence which is a big part of the community uh, they started that 40 years ago in other words they would put out a report that the cia this is after world war ii when they were first going and discovered that a lot of what they reported was in in the open sources and so if you're in a, if you're doing a covert operation and you're talking about people that uh, open source relies on signals. It doesn't have photographs of the ships there. They rely on signals. And they also rely on airplanes that um, every airplane has a transponder, and um, which is it's sort of an IDF. It gives us, it lets everybody know where they are at all times. Well, if you watched, if you read the paper carefully, when the president went to um, Kiev, uh, when his plane was flying, I think, in the Pol from into Poland, guess what they did it was in the newspaper they turned off their transponder and so i will tell you the trouble with open source intelligence i've said this to a few people including one of the guys writing it but you know when when you're when you're really into computer and computer analysis um uh, the first thing you do in an operation like that is you use open source as a cover helps you you invent boats that aren't there you have airplanes that turned off transponder, which means you can't be seen. It's really as simple as that. Mm. They're, they're, I'm being also attacked. They're claiming that the boat, somebody claimed that the boat, uh, the class of the boat wasn't there. <laughs> but we can, <laughs> the guys who know what they're doing, they can turn everything topsy-turvy. They can create boats, signals of boats. So it's that's what you do before a mission like that. That's the answer to it. It's really very simple. If those people had asked anybody in the community, they would have told you the first thing you do is manipulate the, the, the ongoing intelligence. In fact, what they had up there was the same plane that the president had when he was in Kiev. It's called a, a river joint. It's a, a, basically a national security agency, uh, Air Force Wing. It's an old 707 that flies on the border of Russia uh, collecting radar signals. They had, the president had, what is in the paper, they had uh, a river joint uh, surveillance plane from the, uh, as I said, um, there in case he has to get a signal out of emergency, and it's, it's there's a direct line. They had that up in, during this mission in case the guys, the the divers or the crew of the ship or something happened, they could communicate. Uh, it's it's so it's it's um, uh, you know I don't want to break the hearts of OSINT people because a lot of it is very useful, particularly in mostly in in uh, tracking airplane crashes and stuff like that. 
Um, but when it comes to COVID intelligence operators, they're actually part of the cover. Mm. Uh, well, National Security Council uh, spokesperson John Kirby, as I'm sure you're aware, has repeatedly uh, denied the United States was involved in the explosions that damaged these pipelines. He told Fox News Sunday, quote, it's a completely false story. There is no truth to it, not a shred of it. It is not true. The United States and no proxies of the United States had anything to do with that. Uh, can you comment directly? <laughs> Uh, on that statement, your, your, your friend, he described himself as your friend Ray McGovern, recently uh, gave uh, remarks at the UN Security Council and basically said uh, these kind of CAA PR statements aren't to be trusted. What's your response? Well, you, you have to identify Ray a little better. Uh, he was in the CIA for many years and he was probably the key guy when we were doing a lot of talks about with the Russians on, um, on, on treaties. He spent 27 years in the CIA as an intelligence officer and got to be a level that he was sort of the go-to guy when, when we were negotiating uh, various uh, ABM treaties with the Soviet Union. So he does, he does know a little more than that. John Kirby's a nice guy. I used to work, John was uh, in the Pentagon. Uh, when I was at the New Yorker after 9-11, after I wrote a lot of stories that were heatedly denied uh, by the White House when I was at, working for the New Yorker. This was in the days of Cheney and Bush. And I always liked John. He's a very good guy. And um, I, I did talk to him about this story long before I wrote it, and let him know what I was doing. And he told, you know, uh, it was off the record, so it doesn't matter. But um, he didn't say anything, anything other than, than, uh, than, than what he said publicly, but there was other stuff he talked about. And uh, um, uh, he'll be the first, if you ask him, um, if there were an operation like this, would the spokesman for the joint the JC, I mean, the spokesman wouldn't know. Why would you tell him? Mm -hmm. Why would you tell a spokesman anything? Why would even internally would you talk about it? This is, I mean. So you think he genuinely <laughs> does not know that the, the, he, he's he, he's not lying there? He doesn't know. No, no, he's not a liar. He's not. He's asked and he's told no, nothing happened. I mean, I, sh I don't know if he's asked or not. I'm sure he has. But why? Why would he be told? Why would? Right. Uh, I think I said very early, the way they run this operation, the people in the field in Norway or wherever they are in the United States. Are, are isolated. Uh, you, the last thing you want to do with something like this is, you know, you, is uh, uh, telling the principals, uh, uh, can I give you a reason why? In January, they told the principals that they could do something. And within uh, three weeks, both uh, Victoria Newland blabbed about it and said, we'll get it one way or the other. And the president himself said at a briefing on February the 7th, we can take it out. And if they go, we will take it out. I don't know why the press forgets that language, but it horrified the people who were just beginning to get organized on it because it, it just was, to them, it was, it's the most secret thing in the world. And the, the, the Under Secretary of State and the President of the United States, are, the word used to me was blabbing about it. Mm -hmm. you, know, you mentioned just a, a minute ago that you know you you have this long history of writing for outlets like uh, the New Yorker. It, did you approach any of the kind of you know mainstream type organizations or, or media outlets you've worked with in the past with this story and try to get it published there? Did they reject it, you, or, or were you just going to do this on your own for Substack? Can you tell us anything about the editorial process? Sure. Um, um, I don't think I could have got the Milai story published now. Things have changed a lot because of Trump. As you know, I'm not, I'm not telling anybody that knows there's Fox News and the New York Post and other papers like that. And then there's the Washington Post and the New York Times. Uh, actually, the, neither one of those papers mentioned my story. It's been out for a couple of weeks, but I'm, I, I'm telling you, I'm getting massacred by calls from overseas on it. I mean, <laughs> Three hundred fifty, four hundred emails today. Half of them from overseas news outlets. It's different there. I think the Washington Post. I'm told I haven't seen it had a story today for the first time mentioned what I did in the contra. There was a, a, a Security Council meeting about this yesterday, mm -hmm. and um, the New York Times hasn't mentioned it yet. I, I, I just, I, I see what's going on. The polarization of the press that didn't exist. I joined the Times in '72 because, um, and I, I could, I, I got. There was no question about what I could do. It's, they, the halcyon days it's different now and no i never thought of approaching either paper because i didn't think they would publish it I mean, particularly because they want to know the source and um, uh, uh, i always told the editors the source and um, 
Uh, I got burned once uh, at the New York Times that way. I don't want, I don't like talking about it because the New York Times is still a good newspaper and a lot of fine reporters. I've always been convinced that 90% of the editors, if they were fired, we'd have a much better news organization. <laughs> I, I saw who got promoted as we went along. But um, no, Substack is, is um, I have a, I'm a friend of Matt Taibbi, who's um, got a head of Substack uh, uh, column going, and he was telling me it's much more vibrant and it's much more interesting because uh, I self-publish. I use uh, superb editors. Um, I'm using one of my editors was, uh, I worked for the London Review of Books and a very bright guy named Chris Lorenzen uh, is the editor and he's great. I listen to him and I use as far as possible. Sometimes I can't always get him. I use fact checkers that used to work at the New Yorker when I was there. And at that time, there was no worry about sources. Uh, they knew all my sources. That's really uh, interesting. That's, that's interesting to know because some people have criticized you on the basis that because you're independent, you haven't had that editorial process. You weren't able to, say, share the source with an editor and have them you know, double check and confirm and, and, and give their own gut check on things. But you're saying that that actually isn't the case, that you're still using the same, the same kind of team that you had at these institutional papers but they're no longer affiliated, even though you're at no, Substack. No, I'll, ta I'll tell you the biggest difference in a way that uh, that may be the doom for, for good reporting on newspapers. When I was at the New Yorker, for example, I had a big run. At, um, I did the Abu Ghraib story, and I for three or three weeks in a row, I was, and the paper was, the magazine would tell me, you're doing, it's, they were all happy because newsstand sales were going up. Newsstand sales of magazines are just about zip now. But they, uh, the newsstand sales are going up, circulation is growing. And at the end of the year, um, uh, since I was working for a company, um, um, uh, 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 I, I, I was always a freelancer. I never wanted to be on the staff of the New Yorker just because I didn't like it. But I was, you know, I was making, you know, earning a lot of money. But at the end of the year, I got a case of wine. And I guess the people that run the magazine, because of this, the increase in circulation my stories generated, uh, they might have got a hell of a big bonus. Subsack says, <laughs> I'm self-publishing. I, di I didn't do it for money. It's not about money. But it is interesting to me that in the long run, um, uh, this kind of a system, the Subsack was started in part by um, a couple of guys from um, New Zealand. One was a, a high-tech uh, writer, a, a journalist on high-tech, and the other one, I guess, was an entrepreneur. I don't know when they started five, six years ago. But I will tell you, it is the most amazing place. The story I put up from nowhere had over a million hits within you know, 20 hours. And I get letters constantly from people saying, what happened to this kind of reporting? There's not much of it. Right now, I, I assure you, um, um, I knew this when I worked at the New York Times. I knew that I was one of the very rare people who actually had people on the inside who were not afraid to talk about things they didn't like. Mm. You know so what I'm people, saying? If there's something going wrong. And that's it, something, you, it, I, yeah. I've had three or four like that in 50 years. Yeah. And that's Be, just before we let is. you go, can you tell us anything about what's coming next? We're going to let you go. I'm so happy to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've kept, not, we've kept not, you here a long time, and we really appreciate it. Can you preview so, for so us so you, what, your minutes. additional reporting on this subject? What did you say? Uh, what's coming next? What are you working on now? Well, I did a couple more pieces. I just did a piece. Uh, Say Thursday, yesterday, um, uh, I think lying about the And this is Breakthrough News with uh, PJ Prashad, no, VJ Prashad, Breakthrough News with VJ Prashad, if I'm not mistaken. in that conflict all of that is up for grabs oh, oh you're muted, muted. <laughs> we just can't i mean <laughs> you're 100 percent muted but i feel like you had to have said something good with you <laughs> that's i don't believe getting... <laughs> this I mean, global conflict one year on going into tomorrow's one year anniversary the anniversary itself is filled with debate about what's going on you know it's not like uh, something quite straightforward um you know uh, something that was a destruction, an earthquake in, in Syria and in Turkey and so on. Here, how one even talks about what happened last year in February 
and when that conflict begins and who are the players in that conflict all of that is up for grabs is this a, a russian invasion of ukraine is this a contest between nato and russia where is china in this is this a war you know as we speak the g20 countries are gathering in bangalore in southern india and that's one of the issues that they've already dealt with on the first day of the g20 meeting united states trying to say it's a war this is for the final communique you know on day 1 they start to draft the communique united states saying it's a war india which is um you know the chair of the g20 right now is pushing back and saying no 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 we don't want to use the word war we're going to call it a crisis you know the crisis in ukraine the crisis or the challenge these are the two words they are using crisis and challenge in fact eugene you started off by saying conflict in ukraine um you know conflict is somewhere in between war and crisis your crisis is a extremely generic way of talking about uh, what's what's what has happened this year in ukraine so it's very hard to even understand how to talk about the one year anniversary because how you talk about what's happening is already got inside it your opinion about what's going on in this war and there's so much quote unquote information war happening that words seem to matter in this conflict war much more than in any other um you know conflict crisis war that i've ever um followed before in my life there's so many different aspects of this war there's the way that it's revealed how you know Europe really doesn't have any sort of independent policies of its own it's really a subject of the americans on so many levels it's also demonstrated that you know you the us is looking at this as a sort of kind of practice round against china right we've heard a lot of us officials talking about how ukraine is they want to use the ukraine uh, playbook in it, with taiwan and then there's also the stakes that's what i want to ask you about i want to ask you about the stakes because the stakes of the war seem to keep growing um the escalation there there's almost no means of diplomacy anymore you have almost no arms treaties left between the US and Russia at this point you have this explosive story out from Seymour Hersh a couple weeks ago about how the US uh covertly blew up the Nord Stream 2 pipeline attacked the infrastructure of its ally Germany and what I can only be considered an act of terrorism. I mean, the escal the, the the sort of going up the escalation ladder hasn't stopped since last year and it seems like, you know, on all sides, particularly on the NATO side, that you know, there's no uh there's even more resolve to continue to like sacrifice Ukrainians at the altar of weakening Russia. And of course, that leaves us with the whole threat of potential nuclear warfare. So I'm curious if you could talk a bit about the seriousness of the stakes uh, of this war because I I don't feel as though that gets um talked about enough particularly in the mainstream. Well, it is deeply chilling. I mean, look, uh, I was very interested that the Chinese foreign minister went to Munich at the security conference um and he said, you know, now Ukraine tomorrow Taiwan you know he said is this the road you're taking and he and Wang Yi who is the highest um Chinese diplomatic official were asking questions in Munich which I found quite interesting what what were they asking they were asking the united states elites effectively perhaps the european elites how far are you willing to go you know are you going to go all the way on this um are you going to launch nuclear weapons and so on what's what's the game plan here you know what's up with you guys and actually i would say that that's a really good discussion for people to have what is the us elite uh, up to here you know what do they want um do they want the dismemberment of russia the collapse of the uh, current government governing structure let me tell you something my generation um in the 1990s my generation in russia people who are now in their 50s and 60s experienced a regime change already they saw the catastrophic decline in the living standards and so on people in my generation who are now in positions of some authority in russia they simply don't want to see a repeat of that twice 
in the lifetimes of people. They just don't want to see that again. Whatever their opinion of Mr. Putin, whatever their opinion of the conflict in Ukraine, they're simply not interested in revisiting uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. In the same way as during the Arab Spring, people used to ask, why aren't the Algerians rising up? Well, because the Algerians fought a decade-long catastrophic civil war. And I remember being in Algiers, being in Oran, asking people, why isn't there, you know, the kind of copycat phenomena of the Arab Spring? And they said, we are exhausted by this stuff. You know, people tried to come after the, uh, what is known in Algeria as the power, and then said, look, it's just not going to happen like this. You know, we're not going to go out on the street and see our young killed again. This sense of civilizational exhaustion is not being taken seriously. In the same way in China, there's a high level of support of the government for all kinds of reasons, perhaps positive reasons. But one of them is that people have looked carefully at what happened when the Soviet Union collapsed, and they don't want to repeat that in China. So the question to ask of the US elites, what's your game plan? Do you really think you're going to be able to dismember Russia? There's no appetite in Russia for it. You're going to have to impose this with force. What kind of force will you use? Are you going to go nuclear as it were? And now, you know, Mr. Putin has withdrawn Russia from the New START Treaty. That was to have expired in 2026. You know, there's some chatter about how well Russia is withdrawing from treaties. Let me remind people, and I think, you know, Rania, you already indicated that United States unilaterally withdrew from the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty in 2002. That was George W. Bush. United States unilaterally withdrew from the Intermediate um, Nuclear Force Treaty, the INF Treaty 2019. That was Donald Trump. That wasn't Putin. Putin has merely come in on a third run and said, well, you guys are not interested in discussing um, a architecture for nuclear, as it were, management. We're out of here. You know, we're gone. New start is finished. I was chilled by the departure from New Start because now there are no hotlines anymore. There's no red phone between the, the two important countries, you know. And I think that's the reason why the Chinese came to Munich, why Wang Yi went to Russia, um, why they're trying to tell Blinken and Biden and others, listen, guys, you've got to grow up here. Um, there are serious matters at stake. And the Chinese have launched a global security initiative this week around th those issues. It's not just China, it's, it's India, it's Indonesia, it's Mexico, it's South Africa, range of developing countries extraordinarily worried about all this. I was very interested at Munich to listen to the prime minister of Namibia. Her name is Sarah Kungonelwa um, Amadila. And she said something interesting. She first cautioned that this war was going out of hand and then she said, this is the prime minister of Namibia. The bottom line is that money used to buy weapons would be better used to promote development in Ukraine, in Africa, in Asia, in the European Union itself, where many people are facing hardships. That's the attitude of the majority of people in the world. You know, it's well worth your listeners knowing that you add up the total population of North America, Canada and the United States, leave out Mexico, Canada, the United States, and Europe, you'll struggle to reach a billion people. There are 7 billion people on the planet. 1 billion people don't constitute the international community. And in that 1 billion people, there's a lot of disagreement with what their governments are doing. So they don't even speak for a billion people in a planet of 7 billion. And that's why they're having a great deal of difficulty in the G20. And that's the reason why Emmanuel Macron in, in Munich said that the West has lost credibility in the global South. Very strong statement from Emmanuel Macron. You know, I think you raise a good point. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's one of these questions that I think is very much hanging over geopolitics is, you know, all of these different sort of, you know, Western architectures, the G20. I mean, you know, I took Yellen's pushing at the finance minister's meeting around Ukraine to be sort of bullying of India. We saw last year Indonesia was the president of the G20, same thing, constant bullying them to take a particular position to ban Russia, to invite Zelensky, and so on and so forth. Next two presidents of the G20 are Brazil and South Africa, maybe in the reverse order. Uh, but I, I just maybe I'm wondering your thoughts about some of these changes we're seeing go through them, because obviously the G20 was not set up to be a forum uh, for the global South to have a platform, but to, you know, 
include a handful more countries into the Western club? Well, look, the G20 was created, Eugene, just to remind us uh, to provide liquidity in the Western financial institutions because in 2007, China and India were running surpluses and the Western countries went begging to Indonesia, India, China and other countries and said, put some of your money into our banking system because our banking system is insolvent. And they, in fact, Sarkozy said, we're going to shut down the G7 and the G20 will be the new executive of the world. Well, they created the G20, they maintained the G7. Now Janet Yellen came in and started pushing people around and saying, hello, listen, got to increase sanctions on Russia. I was very interested in the response from several of the countries. The first interesting response was um, they basically went to rule. They said, look, this is not a this is not the Security Council, Ms. Yellen. Um, this is a body to deal with economic issues. We, we deal with with trade issues, with financial management of the world order. So they basically came to rule. They said, no, 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 wait, you're in the wrong forum. You want to talk about sanctions? Go to the UN Security Council. This is not where we talk about sanctions. This is where we talk about economic growth, where we talk about the fact that the total global um, debt overhang is $65 trillion. I mean, this is where we deal with that. Uh, this is where we deal with declining growth rates. I thought that was a very interesting uh, and studious response to Janet Yellen. It also shows the desperation of the United States, which is using every and any forum to try to browbeat countries of the global south. You know, for instance, the US Africa summit held in December in Washington, DC, was a way to get African countries to basically come on side. And, and guess what? Here's the Namibian for prime minister in Munich saying, sorry, pals, I'm not with you. Um, the attempt to get countries around the world to send arms to Ukraine, you know, the full court press trying to get Brazil to send arms to Ukraine. And the Brazilians saying, listen, you know, this is not what we buy arms for. It's not to transship them to, to, to Ukraine. And by the way, the reason I slipped and said Israel is because the United States had Israel send a lot of the warehoused equipment to Ukraine, the kind of stuff that was rotting in an Israeli warehouse in order for the, the West to say, look, we're arming the Ukrainians. I mean, there's got to be a little bit of, of, of you've got to understand that they're also putting out their used surplus on the Ukrainians and, you know, jetting up their own engines to get new supplies for themselves. This is not all humanitarian. You know, the U.S. is ordering a lot of stuff for itself. Anyway, the point is that the U.S. is desperate, going to every single forum, trying to get people to, you know, arm twist countries to condemn Russia, to bring Ukraine into the fold and so on. These countries are just not going to do it. I mean, look in India, for instance, the big top elites, the Ambani's, the Adani's and so on, they are buying coal from Russia. They are buying energy. The Indian public sector energy company, ONGC, Oil and Natural Gas Corporation, is buying assets that the Europeans and the Americans are vacating in Russia. The business opportunities with the Russians are also attractive. It's not just this. And also something that I want to put on the table here is there is a growing, and I don't know how to what kind of adjective to use for this, but there's a growing sentiment among the middle class in countries like India, Indonesia, Mexico, Brazil,